Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Armenian Studies Program Lecture Series. I'm Professor Deborah Gardichin, the Director of the Armenian Studies Program. And I want to welcome you to our, again, lecture series, which we have a, a wide variety of lectures, presentations, movies coming up. And I want to uh, just put up uh, what, what we're looking at the board. In just a moment, you'll see some of our upcoming events, and I'll, then I'll be talking about tonight. But just next week on Thursday, Dr. Dennis Papazi will be uh, talking about his new book, which is called Reflections on an Armenian American Journey. Dr. Dennis Papazian was, for many years, the director of the Armenian Research Center at the University of Michigan in Dearborn. And for more than uh, 50 years, he's been active in Armenian American studies. He was born in Georgia, actually, Atlanta, Georgia. And his life mirrors the, the life of Armenian Americans from the period of the 1930s until the 2000s. He's been involved in almost every major Armenian institution, organization. And his wife is Dr. Mary Papazian, who is the former president at San Jose State University. They'll both be coming here next Thursday night to present his book. And the book was published through the Armenian series at Fresno State, of which I'm the editor, so I was the editor of the book. So it'll be another uh, book talk, but I think uh, another interesting talk to hear about this, this man who very much was involved with, with the Armenian American community. He's now uh, plus 90 years old, 90 years old plus. So. It's going to be a pleasure having him here. And then following uh, Dr. Papazian. Actually, we'll go back one. We're going to have uh, probably one of the foremost scholars in the area of Armenian genocide, Dr. Taner Akcham, coming to Fresno from UCLA. And he's going to be speaking on the first dis uh, decision of the Armenian genocide and the role of Kurds in the Ottoman Empire. That's going to be on a Friday night, two weeks from tonight. And we're going to have a reception before that. So between 6 and 7, please come and enjoy some food and refreshments. Meet with the uh, professor. And then at 7 o'clock, he'll, he'll be talking here. He is now the director of the Armenian Genocide Research Center at UCLA's Promise Institute. Uh, the Promise Institute was established with a $20 million donation from the Kirk Krikorian Foundation and Estate. So uh, we are very pleased to have him coming up. And then uh, our third event. It's a movie, and the movie is called Back to Ashtarov, and it's uh, directed by Tigran Dersisyan. It's a documentary about the city of Ashtarov, those of you that are not familiar with the country of Armenia. Ashtarov is about a half an hour uh, drive north of Yerevan. Just go back for a moment. And uh, Tigran Dersisyan grew up there, but then he moved away, and then it's the story of how he comes back and sees what happened to his town and village. It's a very interesting documentary. It's going to be also, uh, we're going to have uh, the producer, Armin Karaoglanya, uh, who will come and they'll both screen the film and then discuss it with us. It'll be right here on Friday, uh, March the 10th. And then these are just our February and March events. We'll have more as we, as we go along. So it's my great pleasure tonight uh, to introduce our two guests, but I'm going to actually do a very brief introduction, and they're really going to handle those introductions themselves. But tonight we have as our guest uh, Dr. Jerry Berger, who is the author of the book that we've been talking about, The Shadows of 1915. And also with us is Dr. Robert Bartabetian, the former president at Missouri Western State University for uh, more than a decade, but decades of service in academia. So we want to welcome both of them uh, to Fresno, and they're going to be discussing the book, talking about it, and then they're going to include you in also the discussion. So let's have a round of applause for our two guests today. Bob, would you want to come up? Thank you. Barlow. Uh, nice crowd here tonight, and we're live streaming it as well. So it really is my pleasure to be here. Again, I'm Bob Bernabedia, born, raised, and educated in Fresno, California. And I moved away in 77 and served at various universities. But I'm, I'm here tonight to introduce and lead a discussion by uh, a lifelong friend of mine, Dr. Jerry Berger. Uh, I've known Jerry for 52 years, which is hard to believe. We were here in the early 70s at Fresno State, and we were members of the Fresno State Debate Forensics Club. And as fate would have it, both the director and the associate director of that program back in the late 60s, early 70s, are here tonight. The director, Dr. Helboka, the associate director, Dr. Rich Allman. Would you gentlemen mind standing, please, just to be recognized? <laughs> They had a tremendous impact 
on our life and on the lives of a number, number of different people from that time period. Well, Jerry, much like myself, was born, raised, and even educated more in Fresno, all the way through the master's degree, and then had a very successful career after finishing his doctorate at the University of Columbia, uh, where he received his PhD in social psychology. He was a professor of psychology, first at Wake Forest University in North Carolina, and then the vast majority of his career he spent at Santa Clara University uh, as a prolific scholar. I think his scholarship uh, ranked in the top five in the United States in social psychology, which I was always very proud to uh, be the best man at his wedding, and he was the best man at my wedding. Uh, yeah, he, he's a professor emeritus now at Santa Clara University, and again, I think uh, cl clearly considered to be one of the top social psychologists in the United States. I could uh, list his publications, but I'm sure Barlow would unplug the microphone because I could be here all night long <laughs> listing the books, uh, the, probably the best read personality book in the country that's come out in numerous editions and a number of other books, as well as scholarly articles, and I could go on and on about that. Perhaps even as remarkable as the fact that he is also quite prolific and quite accomplished as a writer of fiction. In fact, uh, his expertise in, in some areas of, of interest to us, particularly those of us who are Armenian, come from Armenian heritage, his expertise is in a number of different areas, but particularly in the psychological processes of inhumane acts. And that is particularly relevant to the book that we're going to talk about tonight, The Shadows of 1915. And I would argue that uh, this fairly recently uh, published book, which was published when the pandemic hit it, 2019-2020, uh, um, I think it really benefits greatly from his expertise in several areas of social psychology. So it is my uh, distinct honor to introduce my longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Jerry Berger. Dr. Berger. Uh, thank you, Bob, for that generous uh, introduction. Um, Thank all of you for showing up. I, I am seeing a lot of familiar faces, a lot of old faces. I should probably say a lot of faces I haven't seen in a while. Uh, and, uh, and I also want to thank Barlow and everybody who put this together because I know these things don't just happen. It takes a lot of work from a lot of, you know, from a lot of people. So I, I'm very appreciative of all of that. So here's the plan. Uh, what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by doing a little reading from the book. I, I always enjoy that when I attend book events. I uh, hear the author's voice, and sometimes even when I'm reading the book, and I, I hear the author as the narrator. Uh, so I, I've always enjoyed that. Uh, and then that's going to be followed by Bob and I having a, a, a little discussion here. Bob's got some questions. I don't know what all of them are, so it's not like it's all prepared. Um, but uh, we're going to talk about the book and my experiences writing it and other things. And then we're going to open it up to you. Okay? And so if you have questions, we'll have plenty of time for questions. And even if they start turning the lights off, I mean, I, <laughs> I'll be glad to stay around as long as it takes to, to talk with as many people who want to talk. Uh, and there will be books on sale, and there's going to be refreshments afterwards. So uh, I think it'll be a, it'll be a, a, I'm glad you came, and, and I hope you enjoy yourself. Okay, so starting with the reading, uh, it's always a very interesting question, uh, which is what to read. Now, the obvious thing is to start at chapter one, uh, and so that's what most authors do. I'm not going to quite do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read something from chapter one, but at the end of chapter one. And what this is, is the only scene in the book that does not take place in 1953. The, the book takes place in Fresno, or around Fresno, in 1953, largely in the, in the Armenian community at that time. But, as, as the title suggests, everything that happens in the book is within the shadows of 1915. Which is to say, okay, that the conflict, everybody here knows about the Armenian Genocide and much, and much of what happened in 1915. But those events 
cast a shadow over everything that happens in the book. So, as a writer, what is important to me to get some idea in the reader's mind about well, what happened in 1915. I, I suppose everybody here, if you're from Fresno, certainly if you're a part of the Armenian community, you know, you know very well the events of 1915. What has really surprised me as I've gone around giving talks to many different groups since this book came out is how many people do not know about the Armenian Genocide. Uh, people who are very well read, people very well educated, very smart people, very knowledgeable what's going on in the world, have come up to me and said, I had no idea. Okay. And that, that is a tragedy. And that is, in some little teeny way, I hope my book will, will help you know, make dent in that problem. But I knew that I needed to have a scene from 1915, because I wanted the reader to get even just a small feel of just how horrible, how awful, how inhumane the situation was back then. So I put at the end of chapter one, I introduced main characters, and at the end of chapter one, I stick in the scene from 1915 so that the reader knows this is what happened. And what I'm going to read you is the account of one woman who survives the genocide. Um, and it is taken from real accounts, real first-hand accounts from many survivors who told their stories. Um, I'm not going to be able to read the whole scene, and I probably wouldn't want to because, as a lot of you know, things got very, very gruesome and very, very ugly. Um, but I'm going to read you the, the first few pages from that you'll get a feel, perhaps, of the writing and a little bit about how this scene is going. Their feet, swollen and blistered from three days of walking, pushed forward on the dry soil, sending up clouds of dust to sting their eyes and coat their skin with reddish-brown dirt. Tarbez, kept one hand over her baby's eyes. The other held her daughter tightly to her chest, despite the heat. Only her child, she reminded herself. Above all else, she must protect the Barkui. More than a thousand people from her yet had started the march. The caravan stretched for more than a mile, slumped shouldered women and children and a few frail men moving stiff in the expansive Armenian grasslands under an immense sky. Some of the women pushed wooden carts. A few from the wealthier families used donkeys to transport their belongings. But most carried their possessions in the pockets of their overdresses and in cloth sacks strapped across their backs. Turkish gendarmes in tattered and strained uniforms, rode on horseback at both ends of the procession. The gendarmes led them away from the main roads to craggy trails marked by water-carved furrows and scattered boulders. The vast openness of the land was unfamiliar to Tarvez, who had traveled outside her village only twice in her 22 years, both trips to see relatives who lived in the higher lands to the first few days, the caravan had passed strands of oaks, an occasional pomegranate tree, and patches of purple rhododendrons that reminded Tarvis of the flowers outside her home. But now, she could see only a few trees scattered across the horizon, and they had passed no other travelers all morning. At midday, Anig Urganian 71 years old last Christmas, dropped to her knees. Bring water, someone yelled. She must have shade, another woman said, glancing upward. The morning clouds had given way to a penetrating sun. This is too much for an old woman. Razmu Hirganian cupped her mother's elbow. Mira, we must continue. But Anik only lowered her shoulders and shifted her weight until she appeared to be kneeling in prayer. 
the gendarme was upon them at once. The Kirk tracked, cracked his whip from the top of his horse and ordered the women to continue. Razmuri tugged on her mother's arm, pleading with her to stand. But the old, old woman only lowered her chin. I will join you later, Annick said, her eyes facing the ground, when I haven't had a chance to rest. That evening, after a dinner of flatbread and salted lamb, Tarvez and her cousin Sona arranged their possessions beside a small stand of trees. Tarvez raked the dry soil with her fingers, then ground the broken clumps with her knuckles until the earth was reduced to a soft powder. She removed the shawl from around her head and laid it on the prepared surface. Sona used the edge of her palm to smooth the cloth from the center outward until it resembled the bed the children slept. Tarvis laid her child on a white cotton shawl, and Sona placed her own son beside Martuni. Erakel had been born two weeks before Tarvis' daughter. To thwart, to thwart the evil spirits, the two women had spent most of their pregnancies together. The Alk, the family elders had reasoned, would not take an unborn baby as long as another woman or child was nearby. And so Sona and Tarvez had worked the same chores throughout the winter and spring. The cousins often stood side by side, tending goats and sheep, sheep and comparing the changes in their bodies. Both godmothers had correctly predicted a boy for Sona and a girl for Tarvez. To Tarvez, it was almost as if Eric held her own child. She had even nursed the boy for several days when Sona was bitten. Razmuli Urbanian was among the group who shared the fire with the cousins that night. She spent much of her meal scaring down the road in the direction where her mother had stopped to rest. Mir will be here soon, Razmuli said, as the women prepared to sleep. She leaned against a large boulder, a location that allowed an open view of the moonlit road. I'll save her some supper. She will be hungry. Tarvez and Sona positioned themselves on either side of their babies. Sona fell asleep instantly, while Tarvez pressed her nose and mouth against Bartui's cheek and hummed a soft lullaby to her already sleeping child. Tarvez was afraid to close her eyes. She survived the days by concentrating on her daughter, clinging to the belief that if she protected Bartui, God would protect the rest of her family and her people. But at night, when her baby was asleep and the clamor of the day faded, the thoughts she feared most made themselves known. How much longer must they travel? What would her home look like when they returned? And what had happened to her husband? She began to doze but her sleep was invaded by the image of a hundred Turkish soldiers roaring through the billet. Once again, she heard the sound of shattering glass and the explosion of gunfire. Tarvez rolled onto her back, seeking reassurance in a silent prayer. She stared into the endless sky and listened to the sounds of the night while she gradually surrendered to her exhaustion wind surging in gusts, and the scraping of horse hoofs mimicked voices. And soon she heard the crackling of flames and breathed the acrid odor of burning wood. She saw seven-year-old Biron Hilabian race down the center of the road, just as he had three nights earlier. What is wrong? Tarvis once again yelled to the boy. Storms, Darren said, bending to the waist, catching his breath the grocery, and the bakery. There are three fires, Tarvis said. What else? The church, the boy was running again. They're burning the apostolic church. Tarvis was awakened by Martini's soft whimper. 
She fed her child in the privacy afforded by the pre-dawn darkness. In the first gray traces of the morning light, she saw Rasmui still sitting against the board, staring down the empty room, uneaten of bread, uneaten slices of bread and lamb resting. Most of you know the situation got worse and worse and worse. And it's kind of hard to read. And Bob was telling me he read it recently and he got, got choked up doing it. And that's a, that's a compliment. But uh, uh, it also, I think, it speaks to just the, the drama that we're talking about here in these events. Thank you, Jerry. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll start with a, a comment and I have some general questions. And then we'll have some time for some questions from the audience. Uh, the, the comment is, uh, I read the book twice. I, I read it when it came out, and then I read it recently. And uh, many of you may have a similar reaction to it as I, I did. Uh, it's 43 short chapters spread out over 210 pages. But the second half of the first chapter is a flashback. Everything else is said in 1953 press but The second half of the first chapter is a flashback to 1915, and uh, for those of, of you out there who sat down with your grandparents, as my two brothers and I did, or perhaps with your great-grandparents, and they talked about the genocide, it's a very difficult half-chapter to get through. Uh, very, very emotional for, for us, uh, particularly of Armenian heritage, but probably anybody uh, with humane instincts. So I, I appreciate this book on, on multiple levels. I, I have some general questions for you, Jerry. Uh, the most obvious one would be, what led you to write the book in the first place? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I grew up in Fresno, uh, and uh, had many Armenian friends, uh, Armenian families all up and down my neighborhood. Uh, the people we went to college with, there were quite a few Armenians. I was the best man at my, my wedding. You know, so over those, all those experiences, you know, I got to know a lot of Armenian, you know, people from Armenian community and their families and learn a lot about the history of it. And I made two observations. Well, two observations. Uh, one is that it seemed to me that every Armenian family had a story, a sad story from the genocide. Um, and uh, you had to get to know people a little bit well before they would tell you the story, but um, every family had one. And if you think about it, of course they would have, right? Uh, you know, that everybody lost grandparents, family members, close friends, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the genocide. So that, that's very intriguing, okay? It's very much alive in these families, all these families, and I, and I suspect that still true today. The other observation I made was that there was very, very intense emotion surrounding anything having to do with Turks and Turkey. Okay. And, um, you know, it varies from people in various parts of the Armenian community, but I think there's a very shared dislike and sometimes it's very intense, and I was I was I was surprised. And we're talking about uh, at this point at least two, three generations later. I'm talking to these people and their families, but the hatred, if that's the right word, uh, was clearly there. Um, and I found that I found that very intriguing. And, and I I mean, an example like when I was researching the book, I remember one of the women one woman I talked with said, well, you yeah, know, she. She once was about to buy a blouse at a store, and she saw the tag that was made in Turkey, and she put it back. And then I thought, well, I thought that was really crazy. And then I, but I, I said, oh, well, that's interesting. And later, when I was going on these book talks uh, at an Armenian church in Oakland, and I was talking to a woman who organized it, I told her this story, and, and she said, of course. And she wouldn't ever wear any garment from Turkey. And I, I just thought, 
this is like a hundred years later, you know. And so for me, this was very fascinating. Um, as a fiction writer, that's, I'm a wannabe fiction writer, uh, you know, you've got these people, this pretty large community with a very interesting past and very raw emotions. And this is what I mean about generations later, you know, and so many interesting themes come into play, things about the sins of the father and, and, and particularly justice. I've always been interested in justice. I think that's really the single theme that runs its way throughout the book. And uh, as I was, a few years ago, when I was rereading the book, um, I came across what I think is my favorite line in the book. And I'll, 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 I'll tell you what it is and then I'll tell you why. The, the situation is that the main character, a man named Miron, he's Armenian, uh, and he is his fiance, Teresa, is not Armenian, and uh, they are having various discussions about the situation, uh, the events that happen that lead to some drama, and she asks him, are you going to teach our children to hate Turkish children? And he thinks about it, and his answer is, hatred is not an answer, but neither is forgetting. And I thought that really captured why I wanted to write this book, because that's the situation that many of you from Armenian backgrounds, you probably find yourself in that situation with that dilemma. There is a need for justice that still has not been met. So this is just dynamite stuff for a fiction writer to explore. And that's what, that's what got me started on this. So you set the book in uh, 1953. Why did you choose that year? Yeah, well, I want to turn this off. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, you hear me? Okay. Um, I, uh, 1953. Well, what I wanted to do is I, wanted, I didn't want to write a book about the genocide because I really didn't feel qualified. Um, nor was that the story I wanted to tell. I wanted to tell the story about the, the, the ancestors, the next generation. And so I chose, did the math, and I, I had this character that you heard about. She was 20-something minutes. She eventually makes her way to America, has another family. And her sons are now young adults. Okay, so the math works out to be, okay, 1953. <laughs> okay, that was one reason. But there's also a, 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 some other reasons. It was a very interesting time to be writing about the Armenian community. Uh, for one thing, uh, as you maybe know, uh, up until that time, uh, almost all Armenians in Fresno lived in what was known as Armenian town. And, uh, and that started to break up about this time. And the reason it started to break up, probably a lot of reasons, but one of the most important reasons is a, a legal thing called a conveyance, a restrictive conveyance, okay? If you know what that is, uh, that there used to be on the deeds to homes uh, uh, a, a little addition that said, you may not sell this home to, and certain groups of people were listed. And this was legal, this was part of the documents. And in Fresno, those documents included the Armenians could not buy homes in most of the places in Fresno outside of the Armenian community. It was only in 1948 that that was declared illegal by the United States Supreme Court. And so this book takes place a few years after that, and what is happening is this, the, the Armenian community that was this tight-knit group that lived in this very small area, really, is now breaking apart, and that's another one of the themes that I wanted to play with in this book. So, that's Thank you. Just out of curiosity, I'd like to ask our audience, how, how many members in the audience have any connection to Armenian town in terms of their ancestors living in Armenian town? It's great. If you wouldn't mind raising your hand. Yeah, about a third of the audience. Yeah. Uh, and of course, there are attempts being made uh, to, to do something about Old Armenian town, and, and hopefully I'll find out more about that tomorrow when I talk to Dojo. Uh, the, the next question I have deals with the kind of research that it takes to write a novel like this, right? Can you discuss that? Yeah, it takes a lot of research. Uh, uh, first of all, I, of course, I had a head start. I knew a lot about Fresno. Um, 
I don't, I don't remember 1953, but I remember the 60s. And so I, uh, if you read the book, you'll know that I really did, I went out of my way to try to make it as realistic. And I included you know, all the places, the names of the streets, the, places, the theaters, the real places that really existed in 1953. But beyond that, uh, I had the good idea of what was going on in 1953, and that, that took a lot of research. You know, like, you know, how much did a newspaper cost? The answer is five cents. Uh, but I had to look up all this stuff up. But the biggest part of the research uh, came in understanding the Armenian community. You know, because I, uh, you know, I, I, I knew of Armenian community having lived in Fresno, but I really wanted to learn much more about what the experience was like for the people who lived in the Armenian community in 1953. And so I did many, many things, a lot of reading, of course. I interviewed a lot of people. Um, I thought, you, you, know, you remember one day you introduced me to some of your, your family members you know, who were very helpful, and uh, yeah, because they were both had been alive in 1953. Um, and uh, there is a, if, if anybody is interested in the history of our of Armenian community in Fresno, I will recommend one book Uh, it's a book called The Fresno Armenians by a man named Birch Bobolian. Do some of you know it or some of you knew Birch? Yeah. Uh, it's just a marvelous resource, you know, for me. I, I, I kept going back and back and back and back to it, and I had the privilege of um, Birch was so generous. Uh, after I read his book, I asked him if I could visit him and, and ask him questions. And I spent an entire afternoon at his house. Uh, he was very, very generous with his time, very helpful. Um, and um, the, the, this was, uh, and this was like in 2004. That's when I first started to do research on the book. Well, it takes a long time to write a book, especially when you're working full time. It takes a long time to get a book published. <laughs> and I always wanted to give one of my first copies of the book to Birch, signed it and handed it to him, but I found out, unfortunately, he had passed away by the time my book was published. Uh, and so I thought, well, I'll, I'll get it to his wife, and she had passed away just a few months before the book was published. But my wife and I did some research, and we located his daughter who lives someplace in Southern California, and verified it was her, and sent her a copy of the book that was signed and thanked. And, uh, and she was, was very nice. She wrote a very nice review on Amazon for me. So that, that turned out a happy sort of at the, after all. But the bottom line is that if you're going to write about a group of people, you really need to know about that people. And um, I have gotten a lot of feedback since the book came out from the Armenian community. And it has all been very, very positive and very encouraging. The, uh, the woman I told you about uh, at the Oakley Church, um, she read the book, and her first words to me were, are you sure you're not Armenian? <laughs> Which was the best thing she could have said. Yeah. Yes. Someone asked me, is he like a quarter Armenian? I said, no, that's not that I'm aware of. I'm always fascinated by the writer's perspective or viewpoint when he or she writes a novel. Yeah, for example, for those of you who've read Kurt Vonnegut's classic book, Slaughterhouse Five. He wanted to talk about the, the bombing of Dresden, Germany, during World War II. And for years, he thought about it and he took the perspective of time traveling as he told that story. And by the way, Kurt Vonnegut is one of the few other non Armenians who has written fiction with uh, an Armenian perspective. His, his novel, Bluebeard, has an Armenian protagonist. I believe it's in the book of And Jerry Berger would be a, another non Armenian who's who's written a novel as, as a non-Armenian, non-Armenian. Well, the question I have for you, Jerry, again, deals with perspective. Uh, you chose to, to have alternating viewpoints to tell your story, four different characters to tell your story. Why did you decide on that kind of structure? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting <clears throat> interesting kind of structure. I, I'm not the first to do it, but uh, yeah, it, uh, it, the book moves ahead chronologically, yeah. but you keep shifting perspectives. So each chapter, you know, there are actually four perspectives, four, four main characters. And 
So you're just getting each of them telling what happened from their point of view, and the story progresses that way. And it's kind of interesting. I, it, it, what happens in fiction writing, I think, mean, good fiction writing, is you don't start out saying, okay, this is how I'm going to structure the book. This is what I'm going to do. You, you just start writing, and you see what happens. And this just made itself known. It just this was, seemed like the right way to tell the story. And in hindsight, it's great, because each of the four characters whose perspectives we're hearing from, uh, each has a very different view of how to deal with the issues that surface in the book, and very different ideas of like, you know, of, of what we should do about the bigger question about the, the genocide. Um, and one of those four characters is this woman, Teresa, who's the outsider. And, I, and she plays a terrific role because she can ask the questions and make the observations that people inside the community may not ask. You know? and that's why she asked the question, you know, are we going to teach our kids to be Turkish kids? You know? Only somebody from the outside would probably ask that question. So it, I think it works, as far as I, I can tell it works. In fact, most people, when I asked them who read the book, I asked them about it later, they didn't even realize that's what was going on. So I think it's, a, it's successful that way. Yeah. Well, um, another this is the final question I'll ask now uh, to, to your questions. You'll notice the cover of, of Jerry's book, and I'm sure most of you recognize what that is, but I want to give you the opportunity to explain uh, why you chose this, this cover for your book. Yeah, I was fortunate enough the publisher actually let me choose the cover. That, that's not very common. Um, you, if you haven't seen it, or you can't tell. This is a picture of Mount Ararat, okay, which, of course, I think most of you who are from the Armenian community would recognize instantly. Uh, it's been glued up by the, the, the people who made the cover. You know, I picked out a, a photograph that I found on the internet. Um, but I picked it for three reasons. Uh, the first, of course, is because Mount Ararat is a symbol that has been often used by Armenia you know, to represent the country. It shows up on you know, shields and banners. I mean, they, I, I don't know. Some of you might notice they even may have been on the flag at some time. It is the symbol of Armenia. That's one reason. Second reason is that also, as a lot of you know, since 1921, since the Treaty of Kars, uh, following the First World War, where the boundaries were redrawn, uh, Mount Ararat, Ararat, I'm sorry, Ararat, uh, has been inside Turkey. You can see it from Armenia, but it's not, it's not part of Armenia, even though it is the symbol of the, of the people and the culture and the nation. And that does not sit well uh, with, with most Armenians I know. And so that just points out how the conflict still is very much alive today. And then third, uh, some of you know, Mount Ararat is said to be the place where Noah's Ark landed. And uh, the story of Noah's Ark, of course, is one of hope after great devastation. And in that way, I think Mount Ararat also, for me, is a symbol of hope after great devastation, which is exactly what this book is talking about. And what I try to do in all of my fiction writing, I write about some very grim topics. <laughs> I don't know what that says about me, but I don't write happy stories usually. Um, but every one of them, I think, has a glimmer of hope at the end. Uh, they're not dreary. They may be grim. They may be hard to take, sad, but they have a glimmer of hope. And so that's that's what I hope the cover also conveys. Thank you, Chair. Just, just out of curiosity, how many members of our audience have actually been to our Armenia? Oh, wow. That's, that. that's impressive. That is, that's on my bucket list. I'm fairly recently retired, and that's one thing I want to do in my retirement. My beloved daughter, Sarah Bartabedian, has has been to Armenia. And she said, actually, from she was sitting in Turkey, and she saw Mount Ararat in the background, and she said, I just had a lump in my throat when I saw that. I think it has that kind of impact for those of you who have been there, and I look forward to being there myself. At this point, I, I would like to open this up to audience questions that you, you might have to ask of our author, and feel free to ask away. Don't be shy. Beth?
Yeah, anybody have a question? Um, okay, yeah. Uh, the, the voice. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, I've done a lot of research uh, in this area about why do people engage in these inhumane acts. Uh, um, and, um, and so when people see that I've written a, a, a novel that, that deals with, with genocide, they, they naturally think there must be a connection there. And I suppose there is at some abstract level, but the truth is, that when, uh, and, and I'm sure there must be, there must be some spillage there, some, 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 we can, something is, is, is maybe having an impact. But the truth is that when I write fiction, it is a very, very, very different process than what I'm going through when I was thinking about research and psychology and writing nonfiction. Uh, writing fiction is a, just, it's a, it's a, it's a process where it, I, the best fiction Every good author I know will tell you this. Uh, you don't plan it. You just find it. You start writing and you see if you can find the story. I almost never know how my stories will end. And if you do know how it ends, it's probably not going to be a good story. Um, so the process is one that is just, it's, it's fun. It's like love about fiction writing. I'm devoting my retirement to doing fiction writing because it's such a, an amazing experience to just see if you you know can come up with something and see what happens and it surprises me constantly um, and so I think I'm certainly not aware of, I'm not thinking about oh what does my psychology knowledge inform me about this uh, I don't think any of that really happened while I was writing this book um, but if, if you're looking at the back of the book. They really played that up. That was my publicist. That's not my idea. Okay. Thank you, Yeah. Jared is way too modest. Uh, those of you who watch TV have probably seen him featured as the expert speaking on inhumane acts. And so he's, particularly in the last, what, 20, 20 years, oftentimes he's the guy that's interviewed when they want to know about some sort of inhumane act. So he's quite, quite the expert, quite a well-known expert. Other other questions? Uh, yes, Mike. We, we used the year 1953 in Fresno. I was wondering, from an historical perspective, when was the mass the immigration in Fresno from Armenia? I mean, was it following World War I and, uh, and the genocide? Or perhaps, because the reason I ask is, you know, you can look at Fresno and you can see different groups of immigrants, like one kind of comes out on, I think, Elmont Avenue, whatever, in the cemetery was filled with. White Russians. I mean, obviously, that were escaping or had moved to Fresno following the revolution. So, how did Armenians, or why did Armenians immigrate when? That's a great question. Yeah, I'm going to defer to either yeah, Bob, Bob, Bob or Barlow. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll We've got some experts yeah. in the house. Bar yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of my experts. I can just speak from our personal experience. My brothers and, and cousin in the audience. Yeah, my grandfather came for the worst of the genocides, of course, 1915 was the worst, came over in about sometime between 1906 and 1908. And he, perhaps like many of your ancestors, came to make some money to send back to his family. And then the poor man received a telegram saying that his village, Harput, had been wiped out and, uh, by, the Turks. by the Turks. My my grandmother's story might even, our shared grandmother's story might be even more interesting. <coughs> Uh, she was the oldest of five daughters, and her father was a minister. And as many of you know, the Turkish uh, people oftentimes killed ministers first. And so he was brutally murdered, put in a wheelbarrow, willed to his wife and five daughters in, in show, and they took five years to escape and finally get to America, I think uh, shortly after 1915 or even a little bit later, but he was one of the early victims. And can you imagine a mother and five daughters trying to get to America after something like that? So it, it, it varies uh, depending on the circumstances. Some came before the worst of the genocides to send money back, which became futile, obviously, after a while. Others came as a result of the horrible so genocide. Period, there was, what, economic turmoil in Armenia? Oh, well, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I mean, villages and were, were wiped out. Yeah. World War I. Yeah. And I'm sure an expert like Barlow can give you specific dates of 
people coming. And many of them found their way to Fresno because the land was so similar to their land in Armenia, and they knew how to group, grow grapes in Armenia, and they could do that in Fresno. Now, where was Armenia town? Uh, Armenia town? You know where the Holy Trinity Church is in Valley Bakery? In, the, in that area. Okay. And we're, we're, we're trying to uh, resurrect uh, at least the mini Armenia town. Some, some leaders in town are trying to do that, which I think is a, a wonderful cause. Any other audience questions? Yes, Steve? Yeah, you, you spoke of uh, the characters of the book uh, taking on different approaches to uh, uh, what would be just in terms of the Armenians uh, being recompensed for this awful loss, which probably goes beyond any sort of uh, compensation that could occur. Uh, what were the kind of variants that you saw as you talked to people because this idea of justice, it seems that people that are victimized, just as you related, later on become victims again, and in this case, of discrimination, uh, finding themselves in the United States. But what did you find to be the difference in the approach as you saw it through the characters that you're talking about? I think the one was a woman who was married into an army family, but, but some of the others maybe had different perspectives. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So the question is, is, in my eyes, is like, well, how do you get a a sense of justice, right? What, what do you do? You get, obviously, you can't undo the past, but what, what would it take to be able to move forward, you know? Uh, and so I have the different characters have different ways of doing it. The, one of the, the brothers, uh, Mion's brother, is the main character in the book, and uh, and he's angry, and he, he, uh, he does some things that uh, are, are pretty reprehensible, but he's he feels justified because the people he's doing them to are Turks. Um, you know, is that justice? You know, um, uh, and and Miron, the, the character, is kind of caught in between that uh, and and you know he's, he's he, he believes in justice and uh, he, he's thinking about being a lawyer. You know, um, but um, he can't. Uh, he's torn between his his brother's point of view and his wife, who just can't understand why to just let it go, and he can't let it go, and so he's, he's really torn. Another main character is uh, an uncle, is one of the other main four points of view, um, and he kind of has the approach of, it's kind of hard to describe, but like, you know, show them, beat them at their own game, you know, so his idea is, you know, he's going to get, he gets well, he's a wealthy man, and he's showing them that, look, we Armenians are better than you, you take us to be, and we're going to show you. Uh, you know, he's he's got a little bit of anger, but he doesn't do it in the way, especially in the way that the one son does. And and, and of course, those are kind of three. You, you kind of exaggerate, you know, three motives to create the three characters, the different characters. Um, when I talk to, uh, when I've talked to many people, uh, both while writing the book and even after, you know, I, I do get a wide variety of answers to the question. Uh, but what I never find is anyone yet who says, let's just move on. You know, everybody is still grappling, trying to, they, you know, I think people would like some, some resolution. It's 105 years now, and what, is that how many it is? Yeah, something like that. 108, right? Yeah, I'm doing that. And, uh, you know, and yet this is still unresolved. And, what is it going to take? I mean, the, the, the suggestion everybody makes, of course, is that one of the very first steps is to get the Turkish government to acknowledge you know, the genocide. That would certainly be an important step in the right direction. Uh, probably would, in, a, in itself wouldn't be sufficient, but that, until you, you have that, I think you're, you're, you're never going to make progress on this issue. Um, but it's an interesting question. It's an interesting question I throw out to Armenian friends sometimes, and I get a wide variety of responses. Yeah. Well, I, I promised uh, Barlow that we finished before you thought we had one more, one more question. Sure. So uh, my question is about uh, intergenerational trauma. So it's a common theme in the literature of intergenerational trauma, how trauma is passed down. Um, and I'm wondering if there's any examples of that intergenerational trauma presented in the family dynamics or in the idiosyncrasies of certain behaviors. 
uh, of characters in the book that, that, you, that you can think of connected to that? I wish I'd spoken to you about 12 years ago. Uh, I could have been a good thing to include in the book, but no, I, I, don't, I don't think I can point to any example of that. I think I understood what he was talking about. There is, this is well known in the psychology literature, yeah, that the children of it's like Holocaust survivors, you know, have a lot of issues, depression, emotional issues, you know, and, uh, and the cause is the big question here. You know, is it because your mother was depressed and it passed it along to you, or is there you know, some other avenue? But it's, it's definitely a real phenomenon, and I, of course, it makes sense that it would also be in this, in this case, too. In 1953, this is the next generation 